up there. And I, I'm a, a deer ecologist by training and by interest, and I'm kind of trying to bring attention to deer into the invasive species story because I think they do have a significant role that they're playing in the spread and establishment of, of invasive species. As you can see from the first slide, I have some co-authors on this. It's, it's a lot of students and a lot. I'm going to talk about projects that have been going on for the last uh, almost 10 years now. And from, from, our, from our viewpoint, there are, there are two major stressors going on in eastern deciduous forests. And I'm talking primarily about mature forests, not forest loss or forest uh, early successional sites. Those two stories are, are white-tailed deer, which is a story that's been going on for, for 30 or 40 years now, and then invasive species, which is really a relatively recent story for these, for these forests. For white-tailed deer, it's the, it's the issue of uh, pretty much failure for, for advanced regeneration, that you get these forest understories that don't have any small trees, that don't have a, a proper demography that's going to lead to any successional process, that that forest has a lot of mature individuals and, and very little going on in the forest floor. That's in contrast to a site like this. This is a Virginia site that is, uh, it really looks the same way. It has very little understory regeneration going on as far as woody species go. But in this case, the forest floor is just covered with, with an invasive microstegium. So for people around here, they go out and they say, oh, look how green the forest is. But in fact, most of that, that green is uh, not the kind of green we want to see. Uh, I, I always have issues here with uh, that I think exotics and white-tailed deer are, are, should be treated differently in that exotics are an exotic species, whereas white-tailed deer are a native species. And what's the criteria that you would start trying to control a native species? Usually it's the native species that you're trying to encourage in an ecosystem. And I, I use criteria to call something overabundant. And really, I, I stole this from a guy named Graham Cauley, who was an Australian who worked with uh, the overabundance issues in Australia. And these are the four criteria that, that I would use if I was going to call something overabundant, that it causes a significant economic loss, that it, it lowers diversity across a broad landscape, that it causes unsustainable demography of a rare species that might be of conservation concern, and that it it significantly alters the pathways of productivity or halt succession in the case of forests. So I think for both exotic plants and, and for the native deer, I think it is time to worry about issues of overabundance, certainly with the exotics, but also with the white-tailed deer, because they're causing all of those four things in, in various settings. <clears throat> the, the possible pathways that, that that deer and invasives can interact. The first one is pretty is relatively straightforward that they are transporting seeds either on their coat or in their feces. And by their moving across that landscape, they're moving seeds across that landscape. Secondly, that deer are selectively browsing on native species. So you have some competitive interactions going on between it, uh, exotics and, and natives and the deer are tipping the balance away from the natives by preferring those when they look for forage. Third, that deer alter that habitat. They alter that habitat by lowering the overall density of native plants and then they alter the soil qualities by their, by their feces. And those two alterations make that habitat more susceptible to invasion and more susceptible to success by invasive species. So they're not being selective in their browsing, but their very, their very uh, activity alters the way that habitat responds to the invasion of plants. So I'm going to talk about two studies today. And uh, the first study is trying to look at the, uh, for our managers down here, they're trying to make a choice between should we control a deer or should we control the invasives? Which is more important? Which should we use our limited money on? 
And we wanted to look at that to see, can you get the response you want by doing one or the other, or do you have to, in fact, do both? And the primary concern was that by removing the invasives, you're, you're just pointing out to the deer where these native plants are that they actually prefer to eat. This is a case here where we have uh, up in the right-hand corner is, is a bed of microstesium, and you pull out the microstesium, and there's a bunch of native plants underneath there that the deer might not necessarily see until you go through the trouble of, of pointing them out to them. So we decided to look at this in, some, uh, in a national park near here and at, at our research center in Front Royal. And we, we uh, have two co-authors, Norm Borg and Chad Stewart, and we worked on the CNO Canal and at our research center here in Front Royal. These are, it's just an experimental thing, so it was done on a small scale, four by four meter plots with uh, subplots within those to look at the, the woody and the herbaceous content. And you can see we took the usual number of measurements that someone would take in this kind of study. We, we have all our conditions in this study. We have plots where we did nothing. We have plots where we pulled all the invasives, and we're not saying that pulling invasives is the way to go, but it's the simplest way to go on a study of the scale that we're talking about. Uh, it's uh, the four by four meter plots can readily be pulled without too much disturbance or, or uh, too much effort. So we pull the invasives, or we fence to exclude the deer, or we have plots where we did both. We, we pulled the invasives and fenced out the deer. This is an example of what a plots at the uh, CNO canal look like. This is the microstesium, Japanese silkgrass in this, in this case. And you can see it's in the upper left-hand corner how patchy it is across that environment. And that's a plot um, that we have set up there. And each one of those flags represents the corner of a one by one meter plot. <coughs> you can see the density of the, the microstesium in this case. Uh, here is an example of a plot in the upper right-hand corner before we pull it and a plot in the lower left-hand corner after it's been, the invasives have been pulled. And those invasives were pulled twice a year uh, over the course of the study. Here's an example of a fence plot where we've fenced out the deer and we've also pulled the invasives. We made a, we made a buffer around the outside of the fenced area uh, to prevent any incursions between our sampling periods. But that's an example of everything that's left inside there is a native plant, and outside, in this case, there's a sea of, of microstesium. Uh, so there's 325 plots. We set them up in 2005. We checked them in 2007, 2009, and again in 2013, but I don't have the 2013 data in this in this slideshow here, we can we can get away with just this 2009 resurvey, and the results are uh, mixed as far as what you want, what what you might expect to see. Uh, I've done a lot of these experiments, and if you want to see any results on seedlings, you're going to have to I don't know, you're going to have to be extremely lucky. Seedlings are a very variable class of plants. There are good seedling years and there are bad seedling years, and it has nothing to do with deer or invasives. It has mostly to do with the seed production out of the trees and the amount of moisture in the ground that year, that that's what drives that seedling crop. So if we have this, this figure here, we have on the left, we have sites that initially had low invasive cover, and on the right, we have sites that had high invasive cover, and we just have the, the relative abundance of those thing, woody seedlings at the beginning and the end of the study. And you do see significant results for both pulling the invasives and for pulling and fencing when the initial cover is high. But you can see the error bars on this prevent a lot of things from being significant. And it's just that there are good years and there are bad years, and that, that makes these, these projects a little bit difficult when you're talking about seedlings. There is one interesting uh, thing that I'd make at this point was that we were worried that excluding the deer would increase the invasive cover. So we can look at how what happens to the percent cover of invasive plants once we got rid of the deer. And if you look on the right hand, you see nothing 
a marginal response here when there's a low initial invasive cover. But for sites that are already infected with invasives, you can see a significant reduction in the invasive cover once the deer are removed. So that, that was a good idea. That was a good finding that, that invasives, the, the amount of cover invasives does not increase following deer removal. Uh, it, it generally decreases. If we look at saplings, the, res the results are very different from saplings. And, and that is also the case when you're doing just straight deer experiments, that for deer, the big transition is from seedling to sapling. That's where deer have their impact. And if you look at this figure here, we're looking at just the sapling data, and we're looking at the abundance of saplings for our control plots, our pulley invasive plots, the fence plots, and the plots that have both. And you can see that pulling the invasives had no impact on the amount of saplings you had after four years, uh, pretty much equal to the control sites. But fencing and fencing and pulling together those things did have, uh, you can more than double the amount of saplings by fencing out those deer. And pulling the invasives did not add anything to that. So there was no kind of synergy going on where you got more, you got the most saplings when you ha did both activities. Pretty much saplings were driven by, by deer. That, that's, the, that's the main message there. Uh, a disturbing thing is this increase in invasive woody seedling, saplings. So if you look under fenced, uh, the, the main response there was not in increase in native things, but you actually got a, a bigger response in the increase in invasive woody plants. That, that's, that's a problem. So you're, maybe you're not, pulling, you're not pulling invasives to encourage native, native species. You're pulling invasives to prevent the incursion of these, these woody seedlings coming in following your exclusion of the deer. We did have, uh, I should point out that there's a recommended stocking rate that when you, before you harvest a forest, you, you're looking for a pre-stocking rate, a number of sap, a density of seedlings that would allow you to move successfully into some sort of succession. And that, in our case, that comes out to about five, five saplings per plot. And we don't reach that after four years with our native species. So four years of getting rid of the deer and pulling the invasives does not produce enough, sa enough native saplings in order to have successful succession in that plot. But it does produce enough invasive saplings in the case of just fencing. So just fencing out the deer, you will get succession in that plot, but it won't go the way you want it to go. It'll go toward invasives as opposed to native species. Uh, that's pooling all species together, treating everything as equal, but everything is not equal. The species, these native species are not equal to each other. And I'll give you an example of two here. This is red maple. There's nothing you can do to red maple that changes its, its, its demography in any way. You can pull the invasives, you can control the deer, you can do neither, and you get just as many red maples before or after. There's no real changes that go on. They are uh, essentially immune to any of these uh, perturbances that we have out there in the landscape. That's not the case for red oaks or oaks in general. That for the oaks, we only saw a significant response when we both fenced out the deer and pulled the invasives. So here's a, here's a species where fencing out the deer alone did not improve the situation. It was only when we did the combination of the two. So when you look generically across all natives, you don't have very many, you don't have very many uh, reasons for pulling. But if you're looking at specifically oaks, you do have a reason for pulling out invasives because only there do you get any kind of response. And if we look at that, if we look at the saplings, on a number basis, here's looking at the number of saplings that were produced after four years and their density per plot. And you can see how uh, doing both uh, pulling and fencing had a, a much marked response over anything else that was done. And that pulling by itself was relatively useless. And that's important because uh, especially in your part of the world and, and our part of the world here down in the Mid-Atlantic, the uh, 
we're concerned about these oak forests. These oak forests are declining. These oak forests are transitioning into red maple. Red maple is a much poorer mass crop tree than, than oaks. They're going to be able to support much less wildlife. And foresters, for the most part, are very concerned about how do we how do we flip this transition that's going on now toward a maple forest? And it could be that the invasives and the deer together are part of the issue of, of why we're getting so much uh, maple now rather than before. Uh, fire is, is definitely another part of it, but that's a, that's a story for another day. Uh, I wanted to switch to a second project now that we, we followed up on that first project. And this has to do with a, a plot system that we've established within the Smithsonian across the world, which is really a large tree forest plot. Uh, the first one was done in Panama where someone, Steve Hubble, took 50 hectares and mapped, measured, marked every single stem more than a centimeter dBH in that entire 50 hectares. That's a big project. We did the same thing in Front Royal, except we went to 26 hectares. Uh, we, we got all the diversity we wanted to measure within that 26 hectares, and we, we went through that plot in 2008 and identified all those seedlings. Uh, this is, we, once we had done the trees and we followed it up with soil measurements, uh, exotic plants, small mammals, seedlings, we measured those uh, exotic plants in 2010 and we resurve it, we're resurveying them right now in 2014. This forest is a typical eastern deciduous forest. It's relatively secondary, but it has a, a good oak hickory component with a yellow poplar, tulip poplar, uh, significant component also. Has about 62 species across that 26 hectares. If we, we've cored 600 of those trees to look at the age structure of that forest, and you can see most of the trees come out between 60 and 100 years old, so it's a typical secondary forest. This, this grid has one unusual feature in that it is, it is fenced to exclude deer in four hectares of the site, and that fence was put up well before this project began. So what you have is, if you look at that upper right-hand picture, the right corner is inside the fence and the left corner is outside the fence, and you can see we have a very different structure of the forest inside the deer exclosure than outside the deer exclosure. And this is what got us started in the first place. If you look at some of these exotics like Microsthesium, they come up to that deer fence, but they do not go inside the deer fence. And we thought, well, and it, it just could we quantify somehow the relationship between these exotics and this deer exclusion area? So we decided to look at a bunch of exotics. And the ones we have in our area are wineberry, uh, Japanese barberry, we have Japanese stiltgrass, of course, we have, and multiflora rose. Those are our four species. And we had four steps we had to go through in order to get this project to go. First, we couldn't use the whole 26 hectares because the, the exclusion plot is not the same as the other parts of the plot have streams and roads, and we wanted to come up with a control area and only con compare the control area to the experimental area. So we looked at the forest canopy and we classified the forest canopy and selected an area that has the, the most similar forest canopy to the, to the deer exclosure site. So the deer exclosure site is down on the bottom of this graph and the control site is up on the top of this graph and each one of those colored squares represents a forest type uh, based on the, the species list and the species sizes inside of that 20 by 20 meter plot. So now we have our control plot identified. The next thing we did was we generated a regression tree for all the squares, using all the squares outside of the two plots, and, and found the important variables for each invasive, and then added in deer, no deer as a second variable in the second run of this regression tree. Uh, we have, here's my co-authors, Norm Borg and Shali Shen and Jen, Jenny McGarvey. We, so we have our invasives that we're measuring up on the top, and then we have all of these uh, environmental variables that we're measuring down at the bottom. We do the first run through with the environmental variables, then we run it through again with deer, no deer, uh, 
in the second set of tests. We did a test using wild comfrey because that's a, that's a native plant, but we know it's dispersed by deer. And if this procedure works, then we should be able to uh, see differences inside and outside the fence for wild comfrey. So the top uh, regression tree up there looks at the variables that are important for wild comfrey without deer exclosure, and then we add in the deer exclosure, and we see if the fence comes out to be one of the significant variables. And it does. You can see it there under two, fence. There's yes and no, and under fence, yes, if you look at the density of comfrey, it's one plant for every 100 squares inside the plot, which is a very low density, and it's what you would expect. And there's higher densities, 3, 12.7, 25.0 outside that plot. So there's big differences for comfrey, as you would expect. So let's look at these other invasive species. The first one we look at are multi-floor rows. Again, at the top, you have what's important for that, ver for that plant when you don't consider the deer fencing, and then when you go below, you look at deer fencing, yes and no, does come out to be important, but it's the opposite of what I would have predicted in that there are actually more multi rows inside the deer exclosure than outside the deer exclosure. So deer are not facilitating anything going on with the arrival of this plant, but they are their lack of browsing is probably allowing this plant to persist inside the fence at higher densities than they are outside the fence. If I look at the other invasives, though, it works the other way. Here's Japanese barberry. Again, you have the variables at the top. And if you look at the bottom, the density inside the fence is, is one half to one third the density outside the fence. And it's a significant predictor of, of the occurrence of barberry. If I look at wineberry, it's the same thing. Nitrogen is all that's important on the outside. If you, if you look, if you bring the fence into the equation, the fence is important, and the density of barberry, two, plant, two, two plants for every 10 squares is uh, an order of magnitude lower than the density of barberry in those plots outside the fence. Microstesium that started all this thing is the same way. You've got a bunch of variables that are important when you don't consider the fence, when you look at deer exposure and you look at deer, yes, the density there is much smaller than the density outside the fence. In the case of barberry uh, silk grass, we did not count individuals, but we made relative abundance classes. So that change in number is really uh, a, quite a significant change. It's only inside the fence that you get a lot of cells that are empty, have zeros you very rarely find a zero outside that fence. So it is making a difference outside that fence. So what do we find out from these two studies that deer do play a role in the establishment of exotic species in this forest, that it's not the same for all species, that in the case of multiflora rose, there is no impact due to the deer, but for the other species there are. What is that difference due to? Uh, in some respects, I can't answer that question because I didn't design this second uh, project properly. That fence was up for 20 years before we started the project. And there are changes that went on before the project started. So if I, if I have my list of environmental variables here, there are significantly higher species diversity inside the fence, significantly more stems inside the fence and nitrogen and, and phosphorus levels are significantly lower inside the fence than outside the fence. So if you go back to that original idea that deer are changing that habitat, they changed that habitat well before those invasive species showed up. And that, I can't tell a difference between lack of browsing and changing the habitat as, as determining factors here. So if I look at my three my three variables that I started out with, we see no evidence that deer are transporting any of these species internally or externally. There is evidence for Japanese honeysuckle, but not for any of the species that we studied in this, in this project. That deer are selectively browsing on native species, I cannot exclude this, and there is an excellent study that's come from Sue Callitz recently in the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences that looks at the relationship between garlic, mustard, and trillium. And she did find that browsing by deer on trillium, selective browsing by deer on trillium, 
does shift the competitive interaction between garlic, mustard, and trillium. I don't have that evidence here. My evidence is much more that that excluding deer, lowering the deer density, changes the environment of that plot. And by changing that environment of that plot, by lowering that nitrogen, lowering that phosphorus, and increasing the number of native species inside the plot for both barberry, wineberry, and that stilt grass, it reduces their ability to colonize that plot. I've, I've spent a lot of years showing this slide here with the way that deer rule the world and they have an influence on so many different things that, that you could never imagine. And really, you have to add invasive species into that whole equation, that, that deer are impacting those invasive plants, the, their ability to colonize and, and be at a site. And that, in turn, changes the ability of oak seedlings to transfer into saplings changes the soil moisture, soil nutrients, and sunlight levels in that plot. So it's like a new player in my, in my equation here, and a player that interacts with deer and then has impacts on its own that are different than, than those by deer alone. So that's the, that's the end of this, and I'd be happy to take any questions.